I thought it was fine to read the books, know the books, and sleep on Fridays. She did not see it that way. As much as my goal was to sleep as much as possible in English, her goal was to keep me awake as much as possible, hence the warfare that developed between us. Sometimes she would walk up and down the aisles, the rows between the desks while she talked. And she wasn't married, I remember that, but she wore a ring of some sort on her right hand and she would turn that ring in so that the stone or the face of the ring was on the inside. And when she would get to my desk, if I was asleep, she would wrap me on the top of the head with her hand and she would say, Jose, this is not siesta time. Every single time. It drove me crazy. I thought it was stupid. <laughs> she had a weird sense of humor. I was, what, 15 years old, turning 16 years old, not an age where you really appreciated weird senses of humor. Public school, 1961, not air conditioned. So in the early fall, while the weather was still hot, all the windows would be open. It was an old school building, even then, with big single pane windows that raised up and down. You remember what they looked like. It had a ledge along the, uh, the windowsill, was a wide ledge, that almost made a bench about four feet off the floor. Now our class was on the first floor but there was a basement beneath us. And there was a classroom above us. Along the building on the outside, along the basement windows, it was the grade had fell off so that the basement there had windows on one side of the building. Along those windows there was a row of large shrubs. Above us, on the second floor, immediately over the English class, was the Latin classroom. And the Latin teacher was notoriously lax in maintaining any kind of discipline in his class. A great man, a wonderful human being, but he just kind of, I, I had took Latin from him for two years and never learned a bit of Latin, but I had a great time. <laughs> And so frequently, the students in the classroom above us would wad up paper and throw paper out the windows, and they would come flying down past our window. If Miss Benson happened to notice this, she would always do the same thing. She would shriek, it's snowing, it's snowing. <laughs> and she would run across the classroom and leap up and perch on the bench, the sill, and she would lean, lean out and catch one of these paper balls and then try to throw the paper ball back up through the window. And of course you can't do that. It would just, you know, kind of be like this. I just thought it was stupid. One afternoon she was perched in the open window. Open window. She liked to do that. She would sit up with her, her feet up on a stool. She was perched up on the window sill talking about something to us, I don't remember what, when paper started falling behind her and one of the students said, Miss Benson, it's snowing. <laughs> she looked up and almost instinctively, I believe, she leaned back to catch the ball and fell out of the window. <laughs> she was just gone. <laughs> she was sitting there and all of a sudden, she disappeared. The last thing we thought was the bottom of her feet. She just went like that. We were stunned. We didn't, nobody said a word. We just all sat there. And about a minute or two, maybe longer, maybe two minutes, she came in through the door, came down the hall, came in through the door, brushing leaves off of her clothes. When it got cold, she liked to sit and wrap her feet in her sweater and put her feet in her desk drawer. <laughs> she would open the bottom drawer of her desk and she would wrap her feet in her sweater and then she would stick her feet down in the... I hated her. I thought she was crazy. And all I wanted to do was be left alone so I could sleep. 
So one morning, on our way into school, I say our way into school, my mother insisted on taking me to school every day. Lived about less than half a mile from the school. But I think it was my mother's guilt for working that she just insisted that she would take me to school every day. Maybe a little bit more than a half a mile. And we were late three out of five days every, every week. I always said that my mother would be late to her own funeral. Elizabeth says that my mother was late to our wedding. My mother was not late to our wedding. The invitation said 4 o'clock. My mother got there at 4 o'clock. Elizabeth said that was late. I, well, that's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on our way to school one day, and I am complaining about Miss Benson to my mother. I'm just telling my mother what an idiot person this is, and I just have to endure this terrible teacher. And my mother says, out of the blue, she says, why don't you apologize to her? I said, what? My mother repeated herself. She said, why don't you apologize to her? I said, apologize to her for what? And she said, I don't know. Why don't you just apologize to her? And I said, she ought to apologize to me. I'm not the one with the wild, crazy sense of humor. I'm not the one falling out of the windows and putting my feet in the desk. So my mother said, well, suit yourself. Just an idea. Well, I could not get it out of my head. I could not stop thinking about it. It just kept, I kept saying, it's crazy. And that day, after class, I was walking out of the room, out of the classroom, and I stopped at the desk, and I just turned to her, and I said, Miss Benson, I just want to tell you I'm sorry. I realize I have really been difficult to get along with. I know I have not been very pleasant, uh, that I haven't made your life very pleasant, and I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I turned and I walked out of the room. She and I became best friends. I began to understand her concern and her interest for me. I began to realize that she was just as frustrated as I was. And the really strange thing was that I began to appreciate her wacky sense of humor. I never did learn much English that year. We just didn't get to anything that I didn't know. I don't mean that arrogantly. We just didn't get to anything I had not already learned. But I made a great friend. And for the next two years after that, I used to go by her room after school. And she and I would sit and chat when I graduated, she sent me a note of congratulations on graduating. Maybe she did that with all her students. It didn't seem like she did. Habit one in seven habits of highly effective people is be proactive. Now let me back up a moment and talk about what is meant by the word habit. Keep the story of Miss Benson in mind. We will come back to it. There are some fundamental principles that exist, some fundamental principles that are true. Stephen Covey goes out of his way to keep from getting religious in his book. He, he wrote the book as a, as a business consultant book. The reason he did that, I'm convinced, is to get people to read it. Because people wouldn't read it if they thought it was a religious book. But those fundamental principles are what you and I would refer to as the nature of God. They are true, not because you and I believe them to be true. They are generically true. They are of the fabric of things. They are true whether we live by them or not. They are true whether we agree with them or not. They are fundamentally true. They are the truth of God. They are not values. 
They are deeper than values. They are the truths out of which values emerge. Values may change from time to time, from culture to culture, <coughs> depending on how these fundamental truths are integrated into the way people live their lives. That's hard for people when you say values change, but they do. They are not ethics. They are not rules of behavior. They are fundamental things that have always been true about being human. <coughs> when we live in conflict with these principles, we find that there are consequences. Those consequences follow as surely as night follows day. The particular about the consequences, what those consequences are, vary. They cannot be predicted with perfection. The consequences depend on a lot of things. The particular ethics of our culture, the level of influence we have, how much money we have, and so on. But the moral consequences are inevitable when we live in violation of these truths, these principles, the result is brokenness in one way or another. In religious terms, we call that sin. It isn't that we incur wrath. We just separate ourselves from the fundamental principles of life. Now, there's something in us that wants to make it easy, and we want to define those truths as rules. Then life is simply a matter of following the rules or not following the rules. But the truths are not the rules. The rules are not the truths. The rules are an attempt to interpret the truths, the principles in the context of a particular culture in most circumstances. And as much as we don't like it, the rules change. They really do. The principles don't. Indeed, it is quite possible, maybe it is even common among religious people to follow the rules and violate the principles. <coughs> it is possible to insist on righteousness while living in such a way that is hateful and harmful to other human beings. In Jesus' day, one of the great rules of religion was to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's actually one of the big ten. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Funny how little regard we have for it and how obsessed we are with the minutest of details about rules governing sex, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> 